In Canada, he's a god. In Boston, he's a living saint. But what history records is the simple truth. He swept into the league at a very high speed, and by means of his athletic genius, revolutionized the game. By crossing the blue line, he became the link between Gordie Howe and Wayne Gretzky. Ladies and gentlemen, number four, Bobby Orr. during the frigid winter when you're outside playing pond hockey. No socks. Yeah. As Bobby Orr said, no socks. Stolen by Orr, just took it off his stick. How does he do it? I don't know. My life's a disappointment because uh, I, I, I didn't turn out to be the next Bobby Orr. I felt like Bobby Orr was Wayne Gretzky and everyone else all rolled into one. What a stop by Bobby Orr! You've never seen anything like that! His head was always down, his eyes were always down very self-conscious and unsure of himself off the ice and the minute you put him on the ice he just took over the game i remember that when i had breakfast in the coffee shop that first morning that I was there. The waitress and everybody seemed to understand that the stranger from the United States was there because of Bobby Orr. Probably nothing had ever happened in Paris Sound until Bobby Orr started playing hockey. Our icon was Bobby Orr. He was the one that was um, taking the mantle of Perry Sound, putting Perry Sound on the map. When Bobby Orr was born on the banks of Perry Sound in 1948, they say he already knew how to skate. He was just a little fella, and we just give him a stick and a puck and let him go. I can remember we were kids, and we'd, we'd go out and we'd skate in what they call a big sound. Everyone sort of went with the flow when he was a puck. He went with them and he passed the puck to score. We had a lot of kids playing hockey and we only had one rink, so we had to wait our turns to get inside to play. So we had 10 or 12 or 15 on each team, drop the puck and away you go. And that's really how we developed our skills. Instantly proving himself a hockey prodigy, Orr joined the Perry Sound Shamrocks at age 11. And under the tutelage of local hockey guru, Bucko McDonald, he flourished. He was playing with players that were three and four years older than him, and he was standing out above them. Just from the first few times you saw him play, you knew this guy was different from everybody else. When Bobby was 12, two Bruins scouts watched him in a Bantam League tournament in rural Ontario. When they first discovered him, he was five foot three, five foot four, so that he was not preeminent physically. It was just that he had this obvious, extraordinary talent. This, this, Amazing gift from God. I said to him, Bucko, who is that kid number two in your team? He said, Ren, his name is Robert Gordon Orr. I spent two years romancing, I guess is probably the right word, Bobby and his family. The romancing was less than extravagant. A free stucco job on the Orr residence and $2,800 in cash bought Bobby's signature on a Bruin contract. Now the prodigy was a pro. That's when everybody first started to say, who is this youngster? What makes him so good that they'd take him at 14 years old and plunk him against 18, 19, 20 year olds? An all-star in each of four seasons with the Oshawa Generals, or was prevented by NHL rules from joining the Bruins until he was 18. Meanwhile, Boston fans wept and waited as the Bruins finished in the cellar three of those four years. He was the phenom. He was the future of the Boston Bulls, and we all heard about it. I had heard about him from the Boston writers uh, covering the Celtics for years. Bobby Orr is going to save the Bruins. These various John the Baptists, if you will, were coming to Boston. There's this savior coming. When Bobby finally landed in Boston in 1966, the long wait seemed worth it. He was, without a doubt, the best player on the ice in the very first game he ever played. They all tested Orr. Orr came in when there were only six teams. 
And it was tough to make the league, and everybody tried John for size, particularly rookies. If somebody asked for it, he gave it to him, And he didn't have to take any back seat as far as throwing his dukes around. Tough, fast, and talented on the ice, the quiet boy from Perry Sound shunned the night world of fame and celebrity. War was someone embarrassed, introverted, to the point where he'd hang out in the trainer's room. We'd go to a restaurant to eat. And he was so shy that if he noticed somebody looking at him, it was, pay the bill, let's go have room service. I didn't want to go out. I just kind of hide in my room. I said, Bobby, lighten up. Enjoy life. The best hockey player in the world. Enjoy it. You know? I said, oh, no, you can't do that. Bobby Orr was on a mission. And his mission was to take the Boston Bruins out of the doldrums, out of the basement, and try and win them a Stanley Cup. Although he won NHL Rookie of the Year, Orr didn't lift Boston out of last place, much less get them a shot at the Stanley Cup. But make no mistake, the Messiah had arrived. The future was secure. Now, Bobby Orr, I'm told that you are the highest paid 22-year-old Canadian in the history of this country. Is this true? Well, I'm very happy with, with, with what I make. point B faster than anybody else. Never good. I always said he had 18 speeds of forward and no reverse. I had the puck a lot, and that's pretty good defense when you have the puck, because they're going to get it from you. You always waited for the moment when he got the puck behind his own net, and you could see him looking and scanning and there were those five players in front of their goaltender and they you knew none of them was going to stop them from his wheelhouse behind the net bobby orr defied the gods of hockey daring to cross the blue line and attack the net defensemen never rushed the puck past center defensemen never went into the uh, opposition end they always stayed in their point and they played defense you're told get the puck up to a forward as soon as you can and just follow up behind but don't take any chances at all why would well-conditioned, good athletes playing defense basically stop playing once they hit the center line. Why wouldn't they press forward? And Bobby Orr was that transitional player. He was good enough, strong enough, quick enough, talented enough that he could be part of the offensive rush and still get back to defend. He was like a tiger on defense. He could hit, but nobody did it with as much force and as much flair and as often as Bobby Orr did. After four seasons, Bobby Orr led the Bruins to the Stanley Cup Finals and won back the hearts of Bostonians who hadn't seen a championship since 1941. He used to just drop into hospitals. He'd be driving by one, he'd drop. He'd say, hey, we got, we got an hour. I want to go see some kids. These kids would look up, they'd be dead, they'd be and the little teddy bears and stuffed animals with them. They looked up all Bobby Orr, and they'd all get something. Everybody wanted their kid to be Bobby Orr. You never saw so many hockey rinks. When I was growing up, there was one hockey rink in the city. They started building rinks in every neighborhood. You know, it was like two rinks in every neighborhood. Everybody was playing hockey. Basketball didn't exist when I was growing up. And the Celtics at that time won 11 championships out of 13 years. They were still struggling to fill the seats, and they were second on those sports pages once Bobby Orr arrived in 1966. Or attracted thousands, millions of non-hockey fans. Women could watch it. Hey, look at that handsome kid, right? Look, look at him go. But didn't have to understand the game. Didn't have to know what a blue line was. In game four, Boston was on the verge of sweeping St. Louis when Orr forever rocked the garden. May 10, 1970, nobody that was in New England that day will ever forget. Sudden death overtime between two fine hockey teams, the Boston Bruins and the St. Louis Blues. A typical Bobby Orr determined play to do it to win the Stanley Cup. Westfall rolled it in front, Sanderson tried a shot that was wide and keen and cleared of a cutoff. I knew he was going to come to that. He was coming in on an angle that he always came in on, that if he didn't get it, he was gone in a defensive position. If the puck had been knocked by me, uh, we might have had a problem there. 
probably would have been a two on one. Bobby Orr, behind the net to Sanderson. Oh! It wasn't the greatest goal that was ever scored. It was the fourth game of a four-game sweep in a one-sided playoff series. It was the greatest picture ever taken. And we reenacted that a thousand million times. You know, somebody would have to, can you trip me? I'm Bobby Orr. I go up. I'll put my hands like this. In that 1970 championship season, Orr earned the distinction of being the only player to win all four major awards. MVP, best defenseman, playoff MVP, and the scoring title. Two years later, Orr led the Bruins back to the Stanley Cup Finals to face the New York Rangers. You had the natural Red Sox-Yankee rivalry, so you had this real Boston-New York eight. Everybody was even, except for that one, one, one player, Bobby Orr. Bad man say they're out. Orr holds, spins away from McGregor to Busick, and he scores! Where did he go? You know, and. Uh, it's a move that nobody had ever seen, and he originated it. Orr keeps it in the blue line. Orr moves away from McGregor with a beautiful move. Shot there! We gotta have you stand right over here in case you don't know what it is. The Stanley Cup. The Stanley Cup with Bobby Orr. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Winning his second playoff MVP, Bobby Orr was hailed the best defenseman of all time. From his perch atop the hockey world, he couldn't see the injuries and financial treachery that lay ahead. If you don't want to hit or be hit, then you should be playing this game. Orr underwent a third operation on his left knee following the 1972 Stanley Cup. Yet he continued to play with that same reckless abandon. He put himself in spots and took hits that most other players would have bailed out on. You can't go up to see Bobby and say, Bobby, take it easy, don't carry the puck. That's insane. Oh, he's hauled on by Barrett in for Dusik. He crashed, he went through, he went through holes, he forced holes, and there go the knees. He was in pain constantly, but uh, can you imagine if he had two good knees, how he would have been? We all were robbed of a lot of good hockey by Bobby Orr, simply because his knees just gave out and couldn't take it anymore. When he missed 15 games of the 1973 season, his teammates began to wonder if the end was near. He had no cartilage left to protect him. It was just bone rubbing against bone. They come up over here, they use the same scar up over here a couple times. You could never discuss it with him about pain or leg. Or, he didn't want to hear it. He just wanted to play. Toughness isn't always fighting or body checking or nothing like that. It's the guy who uh, takes his leg up and goes out and plays when he shouldn't and, uh, and he's the best player, like Orr was. Orr played on and took Boston to the 1974 Stanley Cup Finals. A year later, he won his second scoring title and his eighth straight Norris Trophy. But the damage was mounting, and in 1976, Orr played only 10 games. Bruin management saw the writing on the wall. The Bruins had expressed an opinion that he didn't have many games left to play. And I think that hurt Bobby to hear that. Unable to reach an agreement with the Bruins, Orr was a free agent. After a decade in Boston, he signed a five-year, $3 million contract with the Chicago Blackhawks. Now the fans of Boston are picking on the Bruins for getting rid of Bobby, who's their favorite son. You meet people now who say, I haven't gone to a game since Orr left. The end was slow and painful. Playing in only 26 games in three seasons, Bobby Orr finally called it a day in November 1978. When Bobby Orr came to Chicago, he figured that his knee would carry him at least 50% of what he had done in Boston, but it didn't even carry him 10%. He was so frustrated. Here's a guy with probably one of the most talented players, if not the most, that ever played, and he couldn't do it. I am officially retiring as a player in the greatest league in the world. I'm disappointed, but I am relieved. I would not want to go through the rest of my life thinking, well, maybe there was that chance. I now know I'm no longer able to play. A three-time MVP, eight times an All-Star, the bona fide commercial superstar should have been in great financial shape. But Orr had been blindsided by his agent and friend, Alan Eagleson. Bobby Orr, you have to understand, wanted absolutely nothing to do with anything that wasn't hockey-oriented. And so Alan Eagleson did that for him. 
Nielsen promised him he'd be a millionaire by the time he was 28. All his business and financial affairs, endorsements, were strictly Al Eagleson's department. Not only had Orr been misled in his financial affairs, he was shocked to learn that a golden opportunity back in Boston had been kept from him. Bobby Orr had a chance to own part of the Boston Bruins, to own a major league franchise. But Eagleson didn't tell him that. I went to Bobby, I said, you know, why did you turn that deal down? I don't turn any deal down. I don't know. Uh -oh. When I saw the letter that R. Allen Eagleson wrote declining on behalf of Bobby Orr, ownership of 18 and a half percent of the Bruins. I was, I was dumbfounded. I wasn't paying attention. And, uh, uh, you know, some, some things that maybe I should have been inform, informed about, uh, uh, I was not. Eagleson cost his top client millions, but had ever more to answer for after masterminding a scheme to defraud his own union of pension and health benefits. Bobby Orr literally made him because then he became the agent of many other players. What you had here was a lawyer who was an agent that represented as many as 150 players at one time, who ended up being the head of the union, the union boss, the international hockey czar. Take this hat off, put that hat on. It was a hat trick. We thought he was a god. We, uh, we thought he was the greatest thing in the world to happen to us. Uh, that's how stupid we were. He kept telling us that you guys got the best pension plan in the world. Our pension plan's a joke. If you look at what he did to the players that he was supposedly representing, the only inference you can draw is that this is the biggest fraud in the history of the sports industry. The prominent person he became, he can know it all to Bobby Orr, and he treated Bobby Orr, you know, as a disposable napkin. With Orr present in a Boston courtroom, Eagleson pled guilty to fraud in 1998. He would serve six months in a Canadian jail and was pressured to resign from the Hockey Hall of Fame. As for Orr, he returned to his adoptive home of Boston and rebuilt his career as a businessman and spokesman. The life of a retired hockey player is a tough one. Your lunch, Mr. Orr. There's never a moment's peace. For all of his post-hockey success, Bobby Orr will forever be scarred by what Alan Eagleson did to him. On the subject of Al Eagleson, I mean, his, his jaw would clench and he would tense up in, in... You could just feel the betrayal. He was embarrassed. He recommended him to a lot of people, but he gets snuck into it, you see. Larry Bird, during the national anthems, look up at the Boston Garden ceiling. No one knew until a night in 1988, when at a dinner, Larry Bird explained to an audience, which included Bobby Orr, that what he was doing was looking at Bobby Orr's retired number four. And when he said that, I'll never forget, Bobby was sitting next to me. He reached over and just unconsciously grabbed my arm and said, oh my God. Every time I looked up, I always seen the, the vision of him flying across the ice after he scored a goal. So everybody has their uh, ways of getting motivated, and Bobby Orr has motivated me. It is that sort of respect that has put Bobby Orr in Boston's pantheon of sports legends. Our local TV station had Williams, Bird, and Orr together, side by side for a panel show. Ted was driven by his son. Larry came in a limo, and Bobby drove himself, you know? And that's, you know, he, was, he is and was a man of the people. Orr created the, the venue for all the Boston Bruins players to be hugely popular. He was the Boston Bruins. At the closing of the hallowed Boston Garden in 1995, hockey fans got the chance to thank Bobby Orr one more time. Number four, Bobby Orr.
Everybody's compared to Bobby Orr now. Oh, he's another Orr. He's another Orr. There never will be another Orr. That was the biggest note I remember in hockey. Coach after coach after coach telling us, you know, pass the puck. You're not Bobby Orr. Nobody's Bobby Orr. There's one Bobby Orr. So then you have Dennis Potvin coming into the league, Paul Coffey coming into the league, you have Ray Bork coming into the league. Now these guys are getting 20, 30 goals, uh, 70, 80, 90 points. Uh, none of that happened uh, without Bobby Orr the way he played. Being put on the defense made, made him master of the chessboard. And we all learned from that. Bobby was the man that paved the road for us. Gave us some freedom anyway. Gave us a chance to express ourselves as players. When you see that when you're a kid, it uh, kind of gives you the, uh, not the green light, but that, hey, uh, there's something more than just defense. If there is a player that comes along that's just as great or greater than Bobby Orr, I hope the good Lord sees fit to keep me on this earth to see him because he will be something special. By pioneering a new kind of hockey player, Bobby Orr is mentioned in the same reverence as two other immortals. Bobby Orr, without question, changed the game of hockey maybe more than any player ever did. I would say I've never seen a, a guy who dominated both offensively and defensively as much as that young man did. I like to call him the hockey trinity. Kretke being the son, Howe being the father, and uh, Bobby Orr like the Holy Ghost because he was truly amazing. Injury, followed by treachery, ended Bobby Orr's career all too soon. Although he can't rewrite his story, he took a step towards ensuring that no other hockey prodigy from rural Canada gets fleeced. Bobby Orr became a player's agent in 1996. We will see you next week when the 50 greatest athletes of the 20th century continues its countdown with number 30. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com, a part of the Go Network. Go.com.